everyone, this is another video for Expat Aviator in our S3 tutorial series and today we're going to be looking at holding. Um, this, as always, is designed for people training or waiting to train for the S3 in that UK, however it should really apply to anybody. And as always, a disclaimer at the start, we're not endorsed by that UK, so we make this content ourselves. There therefore may be some mistakes, so if you do spot any mistakes or have any questions, let us know in the comments. So in today's video, we're going to look at the hold entry procedures, the hold exit procedures, coordination to do with holding, hold protected areas, and then standard holding speeds. So starting with the entry procedures, there are three entry procedures, the direct entry, the teardrop entry, and the parallel entry. Those are shown in the diagram on the right hand side. Now, as a pilot, you're meant to know which one of these to fly depending on the angle you're approaching the fix from. As a controller, we don't need to know that, you just have to have an idea of the rough direction which you can see there. And basically it's whichever makes sense. So the direct entry is where a pilot could fly at the fix and then commence a hold instantly. What you have to remember with um, these concepts that we're going to discuss today, imagine it with an aircraft that doesn't have an FMC. So imagine a PA-28, someone who's flying IFR in a PA-28 and they're having to conduct these holds manually by timing it. If you think of it like that, it should make it a lot easier. So as you can see in the direct entry diagram, if the pilot came from either of those green arrows, they could hit the fix and commence a hold straight away. But if you look at where the pilot's coming from on the teardrop entry, if they were to try and do a direct entry from there, they'd hit the fix and they'd have to make a turn of more than, well, sorry, it'd be less than 90 degrees, so a very sharp turn to actually enter the hold. Now, the problem is if they do that, they're going to be outside the holding pattern by the time they've rolled out, which means they're then going to fly a holding pattern that's not what they're meant to, and it becomes very inaccurate. If you're in cloud, that's when you get accidents. So, as you can see, teardrop and parallel just comes from different directions. The teardrop flies over the fix, flies outbound at a difference of 30 degrees from the inbound radial. Once it's flown a minute, it makes a rate one turn to intercept the inbound radial. And the parallel entry overflies the fix, makes a turn to fly the outbound leg, and then makes a rate one turn to basically do a reverse teardrop to then fly to the fix and commence a hold. As I said, as a controller, you don't need to instruct a pilot to fly one of these entries, the pilot should do it. And the good thing is in the UK, the majority of our stars actually lead to a direct entry. If they don't, the CAA seem to have set up fixes that um, set the other two up, so teardrop or parallel. So for example the Rosen 1 Foxtrot arrival into Manchester, you may want to grab the chart at this point to have a look, but it routes from Goals, Pole Hill, Burnie and then Rosen. Now if it was to route from Pole Hill to Rosen, that would, it, basically the pilots would have to perform a teardrop or a parallel entry themselves. So what the CAA did was they set up a waypoint Burnie, which basically meant that the aircraft would make a right-hand turn off Burnie and therefore give them a direct entry into the Rosen hold. As I said, you'll probably need the chart for that to make sense. The RT for any of these three entries is Speedbird123 hold at Dane. There's no need to give a level unless you are issuing a new instruction. So for example, Speedbird123 hold at Dane, descend flight level 70. But you do not say Speedbird 123, hold at Dane, flight level 70. They already know the level they're cleared to, so you don't need to reiterate it. It's only if you're giving them a new level. You may hear people append um, delay times to this. That is a good idea, um, and I'm going to discuss delay times while we're on the topic, but delay times aren't actually mandatory in this instruction. As for delay times, we give delay times in bands of 5 minutes. So you either have up to 5 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, and above 20 minutes we give estimated approach times. So that's the time we expect the aircraft to leave the hold. As a rough guide, we say that each flight level in the hold is one of those bands. So the aircraft holding at the bottom of the stack will have a delay of less than 5 minutes. The next aircraft up will have a delay of 5 to 10 minutes, the next one 10 to 15, the next one 15 to 20, and the one above that will be given an estimated approach time. 
as I said, it isn't mandatory, but it's a really good idea to append that delay time to the hold instruction. So for example, speed bump one, two, three, hold at Dane, delay less than five minutes. It just gives the pilot an idea of when they're actually going to get out of the hold and stops them calling you back and asking how long they're going to be in the hold. Anyway, that's entries. So let's look at exits. So hold exits are slightly more complicated. Now, these are made up names to an extent. There's no official name for these, but regardless of whether you quote the name or not, the, the concept will still be the same. So we also have three exit procedures from a hold. And you do need to know these because there is a difference between all of them. So the first one is the direct exit. So basically, wherever the aircraft is on their holding pattern, you say, Speed 123, fly heading 120 degrees. They will immediately turn onto that heading and fly off. So in the diagram, that would be the red arrow. You may hear some people say, fly radar heading 120 degrees. Equally, you may hear people say, turn left heading 120 degrees. Fly radar heading isn't necessary, because what other heading would we be giving them? And turn left heading 120 degrees. It's technically correct, but there's a lot of ambiguity as to whether the pilot should go round and then turn left heading 120 degrees, or turn left from where they currently are. So, if you're going to use that method, I would add the word now in there. So, speedbird 123, fly heading 120 degrees, or speedbird 123, turn left now heading 120 degrees, just to emphasise the fact that they're not to go around the hole and complete their pattern. But anyway, that would be the direct exit. The leave fix method would be the green arrows. So it's where you'd say speed by 123, leave Dane heading 120 degrees. That's just a standard instruction. What the aircraft will do is wherever they are, when you give them that instruction, they will fly round the hold, complete the pattern they're on, and then when they're overhead the fix, they will then leave it on the heading you've told them. So again, you may hear some people say speedbird 123, complete the pattern or complete the hold, leave Dane heading 120 degrees. It's not necessarily wrong to say it, but it isn't as per cat 413. So if you think it will reduce ambiguity, go for it, but it that is the most efficient and the shortest way to say it. You then have the return to fix, leave fix method, so that's the blue arrows. So this is when you basically need the aircraft to kind of do half a hold. A standard holding pattern is four minutes. Um, now obviously that's quite a long time, so if you don't need four minutes of delay and you only need like one and a half, two minutes maybe, what you do is you would tell the aircraft, speed by one, two, three, route direct Dane, leave Dane heading one, two, zero degrees. And as you can see in the blue arrows, wherever you tell the pilot to do that, they're going to make a turn back to the fix and then leave the fix on the heading. So what you're effectively doing is shortening the holding pattern. Or in other words, shortening the green arrows to beat the blue arrows. That one's a really good one to use because it gets people coming off the stack quicker than just using the other two methods. So this seems to be a problem with S3s in the UK that they don't seem to like this method. Please try and use it. It will speed up your controlling massively. You'll be able to land a lot more aircraft in the same amount of time. The one bit of RT I've put at the bottom, speedbird 123, hold cancelled. Again, th this seems to, it's a bit of a vatsimism that this has been used in the wrong place, so I'm just going to clarify where we actually use this phraseology. We say hold cancelled if an aircraft has been instructed to hold, but you no longer want them to hold, but only if they've not yet entered the hold. So, let's take an example. An aircraft calls you 10 miles from Dane. You think, okay, I'm not sure I'm actually going to be able to take this aircraft off, so I'm going to put it in the hold. So you would say to the aircraft, speedbird 123, hold at Dane. Now let's just say it's about five miles before Dane, so the aircraft's not hit Dane yet, they're still five miles away from it, and you decide, actually, I'm going to be able to take them off the stack, that's fine. That's why you would use hold cancelled. It's to reiterate that you are cancelling your previous instruction. So you would say, speedbird 123, hold cancelled, leave Dane heading 030 degrees. Now if the aircraft was already in the hold, you don't say hold cancelled, because obviously your next instruction is going to be cancelled in the hold. Okay, so it's only used if they haven't yet entered the hold, but they've been told to hold. So that's hold exits. Let's move on to coordination. Um, Again, bit of a vatsimism, but no one seems to kind of get the coordination quite right with holding. People tend to make it a lot more complicated than it actually needs to be. So, 
if you're controlling an airport where things are given to you level separated by the area controller, then you don't actually need to coordinate holding with them. So again, take um, let's take the Mersey stack at Manchester, for example, or the Lambourne stack at Heathrow. Aircraft are given at the lowest level possible. So let's just say area gives you aircraft at flight level 80. If there's an aircraft right behind that, that will be at flight level 90. The next one will be flight level 100. And it works like a tray system. Now there are some airports, the two kind of main ones that I'm going to mention are Birmingham and East Midlands, where aircraft are given under a silent release procedure where they're all given at the same level. So the first aircraft will be given at flight level 90, say into Birmingham. The next one, providing it's far enough apart, will also be given at flight level 90. Again, this is only a select few number of aerodromes, mainly Birmingham and East Midlands. All the others are level separated. If they're given in trail, so where they're both at the same level, then you have to tell the area controller for obvious reasons the point you start holding. It has to be an immediate bit of coordination. If you tell the first aircraft to hold, you need to get on the phone straight away because otherwise area is going to risk descending the aircraft behind to the same level and as you probably already know you can't have two aircraft at the same level in a hold they have to be level separated obviously if there's a risk for conflict that's why the coordination is so important so if aircraft are given to you level separated there's no need to coordinate when you're starting and stopping holding but if they're given to you in trail, you have to coordinate stopping and starting of holding immediately. The next concept we're going to discuss is the hold protected area. So the hold protected area is basically an extended holding pattern. So you take any point on your holding pattern, draw a line out for five miles. And if you did that at every point, it's basically going to create you a holding pattern outside your actual one of five miles. That area, that five mile area, all around the holding pattern is the whole protected area. The whole protected area is basically just an area that no aircraft can fly through. It's just, as you may have guessed from the name, it's to protect aircraft that are holding. So the whole protected area is only active at the levels you are holding. So let's just say for whatever reason you're holding at flight level seven zero You've not got anyone holding at flight level 80, but you've got someone holding at flight level 90. The whole protected area would only be active at flight level 70 and flight level 90. So you couldn't have anybody fly through that 5 mile buffer at flight level 70 or flight level 90, but you could have somebody do it at flight level 80. That's all there is to the whole protected area, nice and easy. So let's move on to the last topic, standard holding speeds. So. These are, as defined by ICAO, the governing body of aviation, um, and you basically just need to remember them. You may think, oh, well, we don't really do anything above flight level 130 anyway, so I don't need to know them. You may well be asked. You could say, yeah, this is slightly C1 theory, but you basically do need to know it. So, at and below flight level 130, it's as published on the charts. VATSIM controllers seem to have a kind of a, a convention of using 220 knots as a standard holding speed at these flight levels. There isn't anything written, you, you go as per the chart, if there's nothing on the chart, use whatever you think suits. A speed of like 280 knots isn't going to suit because it's going to make the holding pattern stupidly large. So I would say about 220, it's not a bad thing to aim for, um, but it is, the official is as published. From flight level 140 to flight level 200 inclusive, it's 240 knots. Flight level 210 to flight level 340 inclusive is 265 knots. And then flight level 350 and above is Mach decimal 83. Now, just a note at the bottom there for you. As per CAT 493, aircraft should not actually be given speed control in holds unless it's necessary. So you shouldn't be trying to speed control everybody as they're holding. Okay? They should be doing a reasonable speed around the hold. And as long as it looks reasonable leave them to their own speed because they're going to hold at whatever's most efficient the, the, the worst thing you could do is give them a speed that's not efficient they'll burn fuel quicker potentially cause you more issues if they start saying they need to divert so let them have their own speed in the hold unless it's getting stupid in which case then assign a speed that's basically all there is to holding um there are a few 
kind of advanced topics that we're not going to talk about in this video that you can find in CAP 413 and CAP 493, such as delay not determined. Um, but this is the, the pure kind of base that you need to understand holding. So I hope this has been helpful. Uh, keep checking back on my channel for new videos and I'll see you soon.